This is Mod Ryan. He's a principal content developer at Jagex. He's been working at Jagex since 2013, and he's been playing RuneScape since 2004. He's worked on, developed, and designed a number of the greatest RuneScape updates of all time, including Archaeology, the Raksha boss, the Tsekar front, including Zuck, Zamorak, the Lord of Chaos, and most recently, Necromancy. He has an absolute ton of knowledge, and he loves talking about game development. So I asked him if he'd be so kind as to come onto the stream and chat about game dev for a couple hours. We cover a ton of different topics, including the design aims of Necromancy, if it was successful, Raziel, and a lot of the difficulties that come along with creating and reworking old content, especially with regard to player versus monster. We spoke on accessibility, and at the end he also took questions from the community about things like how they go about changing things or fixing things, and how they go about designing and making a boss. With the introduction out of the way, sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. First off, thanks for coming on. That's all right. I'd love to be on. I'm uh, happy to come and chat, really. Like you say, the reason I, uh, I talk about wanting to talk about game design, it's kind of for multiple <laughs> reasons. I'm, you obviously see some of my comments, but it's, it's not always about RuneScape as well, like just in general. I remember... There's a lot of people out there that are interested in just game design in general, whether you're a RuneScape player or not. And I always kind of like want to give back, I guess, because I went through the the years of learning and there's just things I've learned. And I just think it's nice to talk about. And for those that are passionate out there, you never know, like, you know, the sort of job opportunities that people have. Well, on the actual dev dev front, I had some like I had some questions and we could take questions from chat and stuff, too. But uh, yeah, as always, you feel free to ramble and take this wherever you'd like to. But my my first thought, just to start really, really simple. So your latest large undertaking obviously is necromancy, because you're the you know the lead on on that entire project. So my first question is like, what were your thoughts on it? How did how did the launch go? How did you feel about it? How was player feedback? Just like totally blanket, open ended. What did you think about necromancy? Oh, it's a big question. Um, there's a lot to answer, and probably a lot of things I can say and things that. I won't say, but just more because, like, I mean, I can talk about it in a minute. It's a bit game dev, but um, yeah, no, obviously super happy. Um, there's lots of good learnings, positives, etc. But there's also a lot of like learnings to take forward, things to adapt, things to change, um, understandings of like different player audiences, what they do and don't like. Um, but we definitely hit a lot of what we wanted to achieve for. You know, I, I mean, it, it's often thrown around like the average player, like uh, t to you or to anyone here as a player. Um, it's hard to explain who the average player is to you. Um, of course, kind of a common thing, actually. We, you know, when having certain conversations with people, of course, you, sorry, when I say you, I don't mean you, Ryan, I mean <laughs> anyone. But yep. um, when you play the game, right, you surround yourselves usually with a bunch of people that are similar to you. Um, you might have the odd friend who's really high level or the odd friend that's really low level, but in general, you're usually surrounded by people that kind of have the same play style as you. Um, so sometimes it can be seen as like, you just kind of sit in your own bubbles. So it's hard to, you know, pick up on like, you know, there are people out there who literally don't know much about many things, you know, they don't, you know, know what, like, if you mention a drag they might not even know a drag exists, you know, what does that mean? Um, so yeah, I mean, from a necromancy front, Definitely a good good amount of uh, positives to take away from you know just the just the general feeling that it's given everyone in the game. Um, obviously, there are more like high high level conversations that people want to have, and there are things we're looking at. Um, I'm thinking about all the things I've already mentioned in public somewhere, but you know, there's the things about um, like conjures, you know, spirits as an example. Stuff like we know that like they have their place and just the sort of friction that they have, and obviously players of you know, been using them outside of combat, you know, not draining adrenaline. And that's kind of become the norm. Um, these are kind of like, here's a, here's a perspective, I guess, to give. Sometimes, you know, we get asked, why haven't you fixed this thing yet? Um, now, in a lot, in, in various cases, there are great examples where, you know, we should have fixed it a long time ago. I mean, people often bring up things like Great Ricochet, right? Like, why did you spend so it takes so long to fix it? Um, but something like necromancy, there's a lot of value in getting a lot of data first and really understanding who's doing what and why and things like that. So it's less about just changing things constantly, because if you change things constantly, you just disrupt everyone over and over again, and you're not actually getting too much valuable data out of it. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of like, well, we have a lot of data now um, about how necromancy is being used, what it's being used for, um, who the player types are, how much they interact with other styles. How much they interacted with combat beforehand? Is this the first time they've ever done these boss kills? You know, all the stuff you can imagine. And it's very interesting. Um, 
I think I might have mentioned this somewhere, but if I didn't, but like, um, but there's some just really interesting statistics of things like, um, things like Hermod and Raziel. Like, it might seem minor. I don't know how much the chat here feel it, but um, they're the first bosses where the boss fight. Actually, QBD is this, is QBD. Do you fight QBD in the quest? I can't remember. To be honest, uh, it's been you so long. don't. No, okay. no, you don't. So then... You go through QBD, and there's like a cutscene. But you don't actually go through the fight. Okay, so yeah, so her modern rounds now are the first bosses that have quests associated with them. And ultimately those quests are purely just the boss fight in story mode, right? Um, they yeah. are like what we've learned a lot from that is if you're someone who already kills bosses, you might think, why why is this a quest? You know, why why what's the point? It's just a boss fight. Um, but there's a lot of value in like I'll say it's like a design cheat code. Um, here's a bit of insight. There's a lot of like cheat codes, you could call them in design, where you can get a lot of value out of something. Um, and for example, making the Hermod quest a boss fight, um, sorry, or making the boss fight a quest, it kind of encourages people to do it because one, it's a quest, and quests in RuneScape have many incentives to complete them, right? Um, people want to complete all the quests, Questscape, etc. cetera. Um, but we, we make the fight easier to the point where everyone who takes part in that quest can do it and the cheat code is that once everyone does do it they feel like they've 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 over they've already kind of um jumped over that hurdle that a lot of people have with other bosses like oh i don't know if i can do it um and you'll find that like from a statistics point of view everyone who has done the quests it's a very high completion rate that they've done at least one kill since very oh high. that's so cool it's very interesting <laughs> statistic because you know, I, I, just to throw out there, like just a random example, you know, let's just say we, when we released Zamorak, there was nothing that said you needed to kill Zamorak. So, you know, I'm sure there are many people who you know, can't necessarily into boss and decide, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go and do it. Or maybe I'll do it later and later becomes one month, two months, three months, you know. Um, so sometimes like, I wouldn't say forcing your hand, but it's, it's a common thing in design. Like we kind of like want to hold your hand to help you overcome hurdles you might not even know you have. Um, but yeah, just an example of some big learning. So I would like to think going forward, like if I was to make another boss or we were to do certain other bosses, which are hard. I mean, the definition of hard is obviously subjective, but, um, where possible, we'd probably try to wrap them up into here is a version you can do that's easier so that you can kind of, you know, accomplish it and then feel like, ah, oh, you know what, I'm going to go back and, you know, beat him again. Uh, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, but. When I look at making tutorials for teaching people P PVMing, it's almost more important, not the strategies that I'm employing, but that I'm instilling confidence in the person that's watching that this isn't actually that bad. This isn't going to one shot you. This isn't going to be so bad because so many players have this strong aversion to, I mean, I would just say general failure of any kind. I think when you're training, when you're doing a quest in RuneScape, when you're skilling, your progression is pretty linear or exponential where you're constantly progressing, whereas with PVMing, it's a wall where you make zero progress until you overcome the wall, and then and then it gets to this really really fun curve. So to me, a, a a way to get players over the hump and make them feel like they can actually do it. I mean, clearly the data shows that it works really well, but that makes perfect sense to me, and I I think that's something that I'd love to see more of in the future as well. Yeah, no, I mean you you raise a very good point there, which is like. I'm not one to talk about life. I'll talk about RuneScape specifically, but it's it's a normal thing in life, right? That a lot of hurdles we have, in in a lot of cases, we set them ourselves, like in our own heads, right? Like, ah, uh, you know, I really want to learn to play piano, but I don't want to get started because it's going to take me ages. Or I really want to go to the, you know, like we kind of build that up ourselves. Um, but if someone was to come along to me and say, "Hey, look, I'll come to your first. Let's go to the gym together," you know, like you're probably going to go. You know, it's kind of a good reason to. Um, it's kind of the same in game design. Like we as um, Raman likes to call us curators um, or caretakers, sorry. Like we are the caretakers of the game. Um, we're kind of here to, you know, help you enjoy the game, you know, to take you along that journey. And I guess, like you say, as a content creator, similar. Um, because like you say, sometimes just having a video which says, look, you don't need to worry about pressing. I think your Zap Guide's a good example, actually, where you say you don't have to worry about pressing anything. Yes, you could press other abilities, but don't worry about it. You kind of like lessen the load. Um, because it is, it is like RuneScape is a complicated game. Like we know that is in like, especially late game. And it's kind of one of those examples. Like if, if I want to suddenly start learning Telos, just a, just a random one. And I, I, I'm still very proficient at the game in terms of combat. Like I, I do know, you know, how to, 
I'd say I'm quite proficient. I've completed many logs. I've you know bossed for hours and hours. Um, it's still overwhelming for me to look at when it's like the guides for it are quite like in depth. Like use these abilities, bring this. Like even saying things like bring disruption shield or spellbook swap. That like that is quite a lot of load. Um, because I don't want to use the term too lightly, but like your average player is not spellbook swapping. You know, they're, they're going to stay on yep. one spell, but, you know, just, just your basic things like that. And it sounds, in its own element, like if I suddenly said to you, today we're going to go to whatever boss we're going to, and we're, we're going to learn to use spellbook swap. That's fine, right? Like it's one thing to learn today. But I think a lot of guides or when people walk into boss encounters, they're instantly worried because it's like, take these, all of this stuff, all these spellbook swaps, have all these unlocks, do all these things, learn all the mechanics. There's so much involved at once. Um, it's kind of why, like, Hermod, as an example, Hermod is a boss that is ultimately a glorified Slayer mob. Like, that's it. In, in all honesty, he's a big <laughs> monster that has a lot of health and doesn't really hurt you too much, but does if you get hit by his attacks. Because, um, as an, again, as the average player, if he whacks you on the head, you are going to take a reasonable amount of damage. If you stand still and don't move at all, you're going to die. Um, now, some people would argue, oh, but you can soul split. That is true. But soul split is a tier 95, uh, sorry, a level 95 prayer. you got to remember not everyone in the game has soul split. There are also many people who have unlocked the quest and don't use soul split. You know, there, there's a lot of extra stuff yeah. there just to be considerate of. Because um, I think, um, I mean, when you did Raziel, I think, as an example, um, you were doing it very quickly, you know, getting it down very quickly, right? Yeah. Um, and I think you were like, oh, this isn't too bad. Or some of the chat were like, oh, Razia is so easy. <laughs> but what they don't, like, what you don't look at is it's like, at the time, I think you're like, you're wearing like Cinder Bane, you're using Split Soul, you've got like an Ancient Familiar, you've got Ring of Vigor Passive, you've got, there's so much stuff you have that I think sometimes it can be overlooked, like, sorry, yes, yeah, Soul Split is tier 92. Thank you, chat. Oh, that's uh, fine. That's so all good. Just, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's just so much stuff that's like there, but you kind of forget you have. Um, I think a lot of people, I experienced this myself when I did, uh, when I played Fresh Start. When you pick up a Fresh Start account or you play Iron Man, you very quickly realize, oh yeah, I don't have this thing. Oh, I don't have this thing. And it's kind of the backwards thing where you realize what you don't have. And yeah, it's just an interesting thing because when we design new encounters, and not just bosses, just anything, um, yes, there are players who have everything, but there are many, many, many players who don't have anything or even just some of the things. So you do have to be considerate in that area. Like Hermod definitely isn't a boss for, arguably, for anyone who was already a PVMer. You know, I mean, here's a design thing for you. He serves his purpose in many ways. Um, he serves the purpose of existing as a just a thematic character. So here's the thing as well. Not every boss needs to be badass and hard. They can be badass and feel cool as like narrative characters. So Hermod was like your first, oh, I've, I've leveled necromancy. Here's a thing I can beat up. And it feels like you're making progress in, in like defeating Raziel, right, as your journey. So that's like one thing he solves. Two, he serves as an opportunity to obviously introduce the Hermodic Plates, which gives you a reason to continuously kill something that isn't, you know, a cow, a troll, or whatever you're killing up to this stage. And just those sorts of things, like they all add up. Like it's a reason to do that. It starts if you've never done bossing before, it gets you into the idea of completing a collection log because it's a it's a fairly well, unless you go rare on the sorry, unless you go dry on the pet, it's a fairly reasonable collection log to the point where you feel like you're almost done it anyway after you get your plates because you're gonna have drumsticks by that stage. Um yeah. so it's just pet left. But there are a lot of those things, I guess a way of putting it, like trying to explain it briefly. Sometimes those things are good and like they serve a lot of value. Don't quote me on this and please don't put it on Reddit someone, but um, I mean, I shouldn't say that because I probably will. A lot of boss design, sorry, a lot of bosses, like in terms of work and like time, it's honestly in the design more than it is in the implementation. Um, we've gotten to a stage now where since Rapture, so we did Rapture, Karapak, um, obviously we did all the old God Wars, but speaking, we did Rapture, Karapak, to Zuck to Hermod, uh, sorry, to Zamorak, to Hermod, to Raziel, between myself and Raman, those are the bosses we went through. Um, and we kind of, like, we just really nailed, like, creating a boss from, like, a structural perspective. I guess a way of looking at it is, like, if you look at Hermod and Raziel, and you point out any bugs that there were in the actual fight, I think that you could probably name, like, two. Uh, um, probably, yeah. So it's, it's like a perspective of, we've really gotten to a stage where we can, like, foundationally have a proper structure for a boss that like really works and it's fairly straightforward to plug into and like create. 
Um, why is this important? I think it's just important to know that like when we can get to these stages, it means we put a lot of load on just coming up with the design and the thematics and obviously designing the mechanics that, that a lot of effort goes into that. But when it comes to actually making it, it's a lot more straightforward. You're not really like starting from like a blank slate. I'm sure in Game Jam, I could make another boss. If you, you know, I could definitely make a Hermod. Hermod's you know, <laughs> the most simple thing ever, but, but like there needs to be value in it. Um, I could take any NPC model and spin them up into a boss, sure. But what am I doing it for, you know? Yeah, it needs to have a have a place in the game and actually, you know, fit thematically and and be something that makes sense for players too. Exactly. Yeah. To circle back a tiny bit to you kind of talking about like Raziel and on release and when people are watching streamers killing it right away and going like, "Whoa, this is way too easy," and then. I don't know if you caught any of this, but there was a lot of talk about a shadow buff to Raziel to make it way harder because it is very different watching a streamer that understands all the kind of compounded combat intricacies killing a boss and then actually getting to the boss without understanding all the intricacies and it actually being kind of a, a perfect difficulty level. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you if you caught wind of any of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely saw some things of like, oh, did they did they buff the fight? Did they nerf the drop rate? Because obviously, I think you, as an example, got the drops like really quickly, right? Your first, your log yeah. was like three hundred kills or something. Oh, it was like five twenty five or something. I was okay, I was yeah. super spooned. Um, I mean, I was super spooned. Mine was three hundred and sixty. So <laughs> whoa, yeah. Jmod hacks. Yeah, I have two thousand odd kills now, and I think I've had like three or so drops between now nah, four drops, I think. But, oh no, um, but it's okay. I, I like I enjoyed doing it. Um, but yeah, it, it, that, that that's always like an interesting um, like view as well. Is like perception means a lot in in anything, um, and when you watch someone, you I mean it's the same in anything, right? You watch people kick a football, you know, professional football players. You watch professional gamers play anything, like. They make it look so easy, and then you go yep. and do the same thing, and you're like, "I, I can't do this." Um, and it, yeah, and that's why sometimes like it's really cool to watch. Um, we can do the same thing as well for what it's worth when we watch content creators or anyone who's streaming um, on release of anything. You know, we can look at it and go, "Oh no, is it too easy? Is it too hard?" You know, we we can have those same yeah. worries. Um, but then we look at the data as well, and we use the data as, of course, as a as a good factor. So letting it settle, do you feel like the difficulty of Raziel with the, you know, with its objective as a sort of gateway into PVM and a test of kind of basic necromancy and all of the rest, do you feel like the difficulty level on it was correct? That's a difficult one, mainly because I'm quite self-critical of all my work. Like I look at everything, like archaeology and there's loads of stuff I'd change and I look at necromancy, there's loads of stuff I'd change. Um, I think it does have a very good position in the game for what it is. Um, it's purposely, um, as players like to call it, a DPS dummy. It is a DPS dummy, but it has mechanics that you already know. Like, he is going to like build up souls. You understand what that means by that stage. His mechanics are more there for you to understand what they mean. He's less of a mechanic. Well, he isn't a mechanic check boss in that... You don't have to stun, you know, like Solak requires you to stun and or, or Yakamara requires you to stun, those sorts of things. Um, just anything like that. Um, he doesn't have those mechanics purposely. Uh, I think like the next necromancy specific boss, which is not a thing, just for reference, before I get quoted on that, like whatever the next necromancy specific boss is, for argument's sake, I would probably look at being way more specific about ability requirements like for example you must soul strike this thing you must volley of soul this thing you know you must stun with so you know those sorts of things so that you are you or you're more mechanic driven um and you use the knowledge of the set but yeah sorry to answer your question i am quite happy with Rezia where he is now i think in terms of he is faster than we would have expected but that is slowly going down or oh, sorry the speed is going down the time is going up um obviously we um, fix that death skulls bug, and then that raised the time of the kill. Um, I'm sure. Um, again, don't panic, but I'm sure you know. As and when we, you know, modify a few more things like conjures. You know, if we remove adrenaline as an option, we're going to rebalance some of their commands slightly. Those sorts of things. That the kill time might go up a little more, but it's kind of to be expected. Um, but yeah, in general, I think I'm pretty happy with it. Um, would I love to make a hard mode version? Sure. Um, will I? Not not anytime soon, I guess. I think, um, yeah, what you mentioned there for, for Necromancy and a future boss that doesn't exist yet, but 
requiring kind of more specific ability recs. Something I've found with necromancy is, especially when fighting like other bosses in the game with it, necromancy has so many tools for every possible mechanic that a boss that's come out in the last eight years can throw at you. It has so many different AoEs, it has so many different ways to mitigate damage, it has so many different ways to burst. Um, that I think that's part of the reason why it feels very, very strong at a lot of the older bosses, just because the toolbox it gives you, there, there's a tool for, for every single possible thing. So I think as a direction, yeah, requiring some more specific things, um, to me, would add a, a little bit more complexity, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, but from my perspective, just because I know you do tend to be very critical of your own work, but I completely agree with you that Raziel, it was probably... A little too easy for a lot of the end game players but for the objective of that boss fight like i thought it was absolutely spot on and one of the things i wanted to highlight too that i just thought was like especially really 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 smart and really good about raziel is like for example like there's a point where he will barge you and he'll actually stun you but he doesn't do it all the time and it's not a stun where like oh you have to freedom it or you're doomed but it's the kind of mechanic that it will stun someone who's unfamiliar with that mechanic. They're not going to die. It's not going to kill them. And then they get to understand that, oh, either I sit here for six seconds or I can learn to use the freedom ability and then I can continue attacking right away. And I, I felt like there were a lot of mechanics that are kind of, they're, they're not forced upon you, so you have to deal with them correctly. But if you are farming the boss over a period of time, it kind of ends up teaching you some RuneScape PVM fundamentals as it goes. Another one that I really liked was the the fact that anytime you're too close, he teleports away. Um, because, like, I'll give you an example myself. My first Raziel kill was eight minutes long because I kept going into melee distance and he kept teleporting and spawning minions and I didn't figure, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand why it kept happening. And it's a really cool way to teach a player in a way that will apply to a lot of other bosses that maybe running around like a headless chicken isn't, the best approach yeah man that's awesome i mean like you, you, you kind of say um some of those mechanics exist for those reasons like yes um i mean in all in all you should be stunned because we give you a bit of ability called freedom and we give you an ability called anticipation and in a lot of boss encounters you should get stunned at some point or be prone to being stunned um the the, the backflip sort of movement thing was um kind of just an interesting test of like like you say, it's not an intuitive thing to learn, but once you do, this is kind of a big headache we actually have. Um, and depending on who you ask, they will argue different sides of this, which is how instructive or um, descriptive should you be <clears throat> in a boss encounter or in anything. But for example, like Razio could say, I'm going to jump away. You know, like he could be quite wordy about what he's going to do. But sometimes that's too on the nose and sometimes it's nicer to figure out mechanics i think that you shouldn't have to figure out like oh it's randomly if he does this ability it's only two two cycles after that he does something else i think that's unintuitive and you shouldn't have to learn that but understanding what an attack is and why he's done it or the boss has done it i think is okay for you to figure out yourself um Razio, of course he has um you'll probably notice um he says something like um what does he say he says, suffer at my hand. I think it's like three cycles before he decides to actually use Finger of Death. And it's intentionally quite a long delay. You could argue it's not that long, but in the nature of the boss fight and who he is and what he's doing, it kind of is. But that's purely so that there is um, a tiny bit of telegraphing, but it's only done in, in words. Now, in hindsight, would I have loved to telegraph the fight better? 100%. We have a couple of issues with telegraphing as it is, and... Um, at least for me, speaking personally, the next boss I work on, I'm probably going to look at like a whole new telegraphing suite. So to give you an example, if you use Raksha, you know how Raksha does a tail swipe and it's a, I guess, I can't remember, is it a 7x7? Seven seven? It might be because he's 5x5. Five five. Either way, let's say it's a 7x7 seven seven sort of area that it hits. Yeah, to actually do something like, I'm kind of doing this with my hand right now, but <laughs> imagine if it's a big square, appears visually, it's kind of like red. And we kind of show it like pulsing from the in like the center point to the edge. And at the moment it hits the edge is when you get hit. Um, look at that sort of telegraphing. So like when you throw shadow bombs, you have a proper like red, um, for argument's sake, square on the floor that like, um, again, starts from the center outwards. And you can kind of read it as, okay, there is an attack here. I can see how long until it's going to hit in terms of like rough guides. Um, obviously, RuneScape is a tile-based game. And I think this is something Mod Jack talks about a lot. Um, take any other game, I see someone mentioned it in the chat, I think someone said Final Fantasy, but 
they use a lot of other games use circles, right? Like we can yeah. use circles, but in the case of a, for argument's sake, a five by five zone, we are better off just showing you a five by five square because it's more intuitive about the tiles it's actually covering than trying to show you a circle where it kind of clips the edges. I guess Death Swiftness is a good example of this. Um, for those of you who don't know, go and chuck a Death Swiftness down the floor right now and go and stand outside of it on the edge and you'll notice you're in it still. To be fair, Death Swiftness, I think, is 7x7 seven seven and should be 5x5. Five five. I think the, the, the worst offender for that is the Zaros Godsword special. The Black Hole spec, it's the same size as a Death Swiftness, I believe. But the the circle is like half the size. Um, but you know, yeah. I com I completely agree with you that circles in a square game maybe not the best way to go. I, I'll explain actually because this comes up a lot. You know how let's use Zuck Fire. Zuck Fire needs improving. I think everyone knows it. Sorry, when I say Zuck Fire, I mean you know the skies burn or whatever he says, and the 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 big firewall comes across. We struggle. A I care about lightning. Yeah, um, we struggle <laughs> a lot with like you know you'll notice how over the years we've really tried to like next level runescape bossing right you you'll you'll know that over the last 10 years bosses have changed quite dramatically right we used to just have essentially big mobs that do more damage and maybe the odd special attack with that of course we we come from like a lot of design experience or gameplay experience of playing many other games big raid bosses big bosses we want to do a lot of cool stuff um some of the the caveats and like the the issues we fall into is yeah let's use zuck firewall and um Carapac lightning uh, as an example where we don't have collision in RuneScape, just for, for reference, anyone. Um, there's no like concept of like a physical box that you walk into and you collide with it, therefore you're hitting it. What we actually have is essentially a visual that appears on those tiles. Um, let's say, let's use, what's a quick and easy one? Um, let's use Rapture Rocks, actually, because they're a good example. Originally, Rapture Rocks, I think the rock is like two by two or three by three. It's a three by three rock. When it falls down, we basically say, okay, when it hits the ground in terms of time, hunt around this coordinate for players and deal damage to them. That's how all of this sort of code works and everything works off the cycle. So similar for Carapax Lightning, as it's moving, um, it says, okay, in this cycle, look around me and hurt them. Now, the thing is, what you're seeing is you're seeing it move as it's doing this calculation, therefore, sometimes you feel like you're being cheated because you're not in it when you're getting hurt. But it's just the nature of on your client, your player is walking, but on the server, you're still within range. Um, kind of a hard one to explain, but um, Zuck Lightning, so, not sorry, Zuck Fire is a good example of this being bad and could be improved. It's just not telegraphed very well. It would benefit more from being like pizza phase. You know, I, I hate calling it pizza phase, but everyone's <laughs> calling it pizza phase. So I That's call my it pizza fault, phase. probably. But you'll notice in the pizza phase for Zuck, it's very clear which area of the floor you cannot stand on. So like, yeah, just that for the firewall would have been great. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's a really long ramble. But ultimately, we're working on it and looking to improve it. Um, just kind of like we've learned from our mistakes. And yes, we'd like to go back and fix some stuff, but... That's a whole different conversation about time. Like, I think someone in the chat earlier was talking about Virago. Like, you know, why don't you fix these issues? It's like, to be honest, if, if I had a big list of 20 Virago fixes, I'll go and fix them all. Like, I'll just do it over Game Jam. But it's more a case of I'd actually need those 20 fixes, like, listed, not as, like, um, separate random things that random people know. Because there is often, like, hey, why haven't you fixed Virago? There's this random issue that we haven't actually said, or, you know, we put it on Reddit in a random place, you know. Um, as much as we do look at Reddit, we don't have a full recap, uh, sorry, a full like overhead, sorry, not overhead, oversight of every bug that gets posted on Reddit we have in our system sort of thing. And then the other caveat is, if you ask me to go and fix 20 bugs at Virago, I probably want to do all the modernizing at the same time. Kind of the idea that like, just using Virago as an example, um, much to potentially controversial views, um, okay. Virago could benefit from things like Everyone who takes part gets a drop, not the whole, you know, if I go with two of my friends who are really good, they'll get all the drops and I won't get any because naturally they're going to bomb tank and they're going to base and they're probably going to do the most DPS because they're proficient. Um, kind of the care pack treatment we will give everyone a drop and then give the spare drops to the highest DPS um, or through a loop. So they say me, you and someone else went, you both would probably get two and I'd get one because you're both good at Rago and in terms of looping through, we'd both get something. But that's more because, just as an example, that's like one thing. 
And I mean, Virago is actually a really good example of the flip side to a boss like Razia, where we talk about like Razia is a DPS dummy, right? Back in the day, Virago <laughs> had 250k health, right? And it wasn't easy to blitz through, whereas now you blitz through the health. Um, so you end up feeling time gated. Now, those time gated mechanics weren't time gates once upon a time, because that's just the nature of the fight. Kind of the same as Rax. Doing 100k damage wasn't so straightforward that you weren't standing around waiting for the web to burn. And Virago is a good example where it's kind of the flip. It's like, if you don't want a DPS dummy, you might get mechanics that make you feel like you're waiting. So how do we find the perfect in-between where both of them work? The Virago drop system, it's, it's weird for larger teams, the way that it works. But the one thing that I do really like about it is it does encourage a player to increase their difficulty level and then increase their reward. And that is that is one thing I like. Like for example, if a if a team is feeling too time gated or a player is feeling like, oh, I'm just waiting around, they can drop the team size until the point that it's not a time gate and it's not just an insta DPS dummy because it will actually get very mechanical at a certain point. So I was gonna say I completely agree with what you said about um it for teams being really weird, because like the TL5, the third player just never really gets a loot pile. But yeah, th that is the one thing I do like about it is that you get rewarded for for increasing the difficulty level, which I think is isn't a bad thing necessarily. I don't think every boss should be like that, but I, I think it's definitely one that uh, yeah, that is that is one thing that I do like about it. Rog is a good boss to talk about because I think there is a very passionate. I mean, like uh, Russ Dan in the chat mentions it about how Virago has a great looting system because it encourages players minimum team sizes and pushes players to their limits, don't change the loot system. It's a very difficult one. Like this is, These are some difficult problems as game designers to, to consider, is that like if we use Virago as an example, it has a very strong, like passionate, high-level audience, but the boss in terms of how many players in the game are killing it is basically no one. <laughs> like In terms of the percentage of players that kill Virago, it is so low that you have to ask yourself, like as a game... We have an entire boss in the game that especially as an example drops tier 90 weapons you know all the other stuff that comes with every boss they have they have items they have all these things um they have you know is there something we can do to encourage more people to get involved in it um i know there are a lot of arguments for well people can do it because they can go and they can try it etc cetera, etc cetera. but it kind of comes back to some conversation we had earlier which is not everyone wants to there's a big overhead of getting into it and virago has a lot of dated mechanics like in the sense of, um, I wouldn't say dated, but I, how do I put it? Like, if we were to release Virago in 2023, it would be slightly different, I guess is the way of putting it. You know, Virago would have a proper health bar. It'd be intuitive about understanding where his health is. It wouldn't be such a pain to understand where to actually walk on the wall. You know, like how to get round to where you have to stand to jump yeah. back. Um, a lot of that stuff is obvious and feels intuitive to anyone who knows it. But to anyone else, there's just so much stuff to learn. And it's not learned in a good way. It's kind of like a clunky way. I guess a good way of putting it, I was around, you know, back, back when Virago released as part of the team who tested it and helped. Um, it's kind of one of the first projects myself got to like offer some design advice, like not advice, sorry, like design ideas to Chris at the time. And it's one of those bosses where like if you were around during Virago's like days, like back in the day, like it was so good. Like it was such a good boss. I'm sure if you ask anyone from back then, I don't know if you played, but like they'll talk about how great Virago was. But the game's changed, the audience has changed, everything's changed. And it's kind of like our job to figure out the best way to like take that forward. Like I, I miss the days, to be honest, sometimes of like the old Virago days, even like the old Rise of the Six. Like people meet, talk about Rise of the Six now, you just one shot it, right? Yeah. Um, even before Necromancy, you just chin, Devo, EOF, you know, there's loads of methods. But like Rise of the Six back in the day was also awesome. So like I have a lot of nostalgia alongside, but obviously it's also my duty to figure out how to like, you know, what if... I know this this is a dream, but like yep. let's just say we all log in next week and everyone here is like, let's go do Virago. Just just as a perspective, wouldn't it be cool if everyone wanted to do Virago? Anyway, why am I talking about Virago? Yeah, Virago's just a good example. Like um No, I, I, I get what you're saying, I think, with regard to like at the end of the day, and also by the way, so I was not playing during the I'll call it the the mod Chris L boss pop off year. That was the one year that I played old school, but the way people talk about it, it was the best year of endgame RuneScape PVM ever. No, I totally understand why you're bringing up Virago, because the idea is it's got this legacy community that has loved it for 10 years, that plays it, that loves theorycrafting it. But at the end of the day, when you look at the numbers, nobody's actually playing the content. So it's trying to figure out, I guess, why no one is playing the content and seeing if you can 
address that in a way that also doesn't completely alienate, you know, its dedicated community. Is that sort of uh, sort of what we're getting at? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, so I just, I'm reading your chat still. Um, <laughs> just some comments here of just like, again, Russ Dan says, Virago's dated because we do too much damage, not because there's anything wrong with the loot system. I guess I have to like elaborate on some of these things because that's quite a statement to say. Um, um, but yeah, we definitely do a lot of damage, but that's not the only reason Virago's dated. We talk about like the loot system. It is a very cool loot system. You get rewarded for being bomb tank. You get rewarded for being base tank, right? But nowadays, because we do a lot of damage, you'll find a lot of players want to duo it, or tri sorry, a lot of the players who do Virago want to you know, solo duo trio sort of thing, right? Um, whereas the boss, I think, in terms of in the interface, I think it's five or seven, right? The the kill time is five or seven. I can't remember. So like from a high level perspective, now we 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 might consider, not even necessarily a high level. Maybe we do consider Virago to be a. Let's just say we do consider Virago to be a trio boss now at a base level. You know, you've got your bomb tank, you've got your base tank, and then you've got someone in between. I think we need to find a good way to make the boss viable as an option for more players while also not taking away from what those who love Virago for what it is. Um, now, I don't know what that means off the top of my head, but like for argument's sake, uh, I don't know. What if there is an option to queue into Virago in scale mode? Um, I don't know. Let's just say tw 10 of us go. Virago now has, um, I guess, let's just say 500k life points a phase rather than 250. We add 50k per person or whatever the math ends up being. Every All 10 people will get a drop. Um, mechanics slightly different. I'm just speaking out loud for what it's worth. Yeah, it's not for sure. Thing. Um, but we can still maintain this default mode. This is more like making an option called like scale, or it's like making an option called um, challenge mode, similar, the opposite. Because ultimately more, I guess here's a, here's a big thing that a lot of people, I guess, overlook. We have a little high level community, or not even high level. We just have a lot of players in the game who want more bosses, right? To get more bosses, we need to be able to justify why we, sh we can add more bosses or should add more bosses. And if we want to add more bosses, we need more people to be interested in bosses. It's kind of like that that um, that loop, exaggerating. But if we can move everyone to a position where everyone loves bosses and wants to do bosses, you'll probably get like 10 bosses a year. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but you know, you will get way more. All the time that, for argument's sake, only, let's say, 1% of players take part in a boss like Zamorak, it's going to be hard to justify making another Zamorak every year. You're probably going to get it every other year at a minimum, right? Um, these are kind of the battles we have as designers, I guess, because I, I love the game. I've played the game since 2004. I want what's best for the game. I want what's best for the people who play it. I always understand, like, the, I guess, the rise and fall and the complaints and the, the positives. Um, it's very difficult. Like, I sit on the fence all the time. Like, you know, even take Necromancy as an example. Necromancy is doing so good for the overall game in terms of what it's doing for players actually involving themselves in combat, like it's crazily good. But at the same time, I also understand the flip, which is, oh, it's too strong, you know, all these other issues. And that is a hard thing to, it's not as straightforward as I'll just nerf it for argument's sake, just examples. But yeah, I guess I'm just saying uh, it's difficult. Um, and that's also part of the fun. Um, like if you're ever interested, not you specifically, but if you're ever interested in design, like, it's not always straightforward, and it's it's a difficult road to travel uh, to like go down. But I think there are there are options that can appeal to many. Always, there's always a solution. Not necessarily the best, but I think there's always a solution. Um, here's a, here's another complete curveball. Sure. Uh, chat, welcome to answer. Um, Rise of the Six, right? Okay. We have to consider the fact that okay, I'm going to speed over the point, but we have to consider the fact that there are many bosses in the game. All in all, they all have their own drops, right? Because bosses inherently are added with with valuable drops or drops that are sought after, right? Because otherwise people won't do the boss. Like, why do it if it doesn't drop something I want? With that in mind, as a player, you should probably want to kill every boss at some point. But we have bosses like Rise of the Six, which is in a weird place in the to solo Rise of the Six, you know what you're doing because your average player can't solo Rise of the Six. Yep, I agree with that. If you're an average player and you're not sure what to do, you take a friend or two or three. You go and do this fight that feels very weird and clunky because it's a bit dated. And then you have to spend, I don't know, 20 seconds running out of a giant long tunnel where your screen turns upside down. Now, sure. this was cool when Rise of the Six was first released. Like, it was cool. Like, the fight was longer. You got the drops. You felt the risk. But in the era that we're in now, where the boss doesn't inherently drop items that are so valuable, like on release, 
it's just another boss as like a stepping stone, things to learn, things to get through, logs to complete, items to obtain. My question is like, if we sit and ask ourselves, does Rise of the Six need the tunnel? And I think the big answer is no, because especially at a high level now, all the tunnel adds is more time than the fight. And at a lower level, it adds this extra thing that they are kind of disrupting their like gameplay loop for some random boss that is, no, is different to everything else. So does it need the tunnel is a question. I think the answer is no, like it doesn't really need it anymore. So these are like design things we have to think about, which is, okay, let's say we're modernizing the boss. Mod there's two different versions of modernizing. There's the, let's call it the quick and efficient version, which is kind of like similar things I did to Virago at one point, which was like, make it available in solo, fix up a few mechanics, let it go. There are other versions which are like completely redo the thing. Um, obviously that one is way more expensive, but let let's take Rots as an example. The, the cave is added friction. It really doesn't add much. If you're a high level player and you do rots, what if instead we allow the portal in the middle to respawn and you can keep clicking it, restarting the fight over and over and over again, and we keep the tunnel, and now you're running out with, let's say, risking 50 energy. This is just an example. Like That's one fix, right? Because that doesn't change the experience for you as a high level player or as a low level player because you're probably going to leave after one kill. Potentially as a low level or as a high level, you just keep doing it and then leave. Um, this concept of, yeah, as someone mentioned in the chat, streaking and risk is also something we've tried to, like, we're considering moving away from, right? Like, I think people have heard about, you know, why lose something you committed to? Like, what value is that really offering you? You earned it, why lose it? So that's kind of another dated drops mechanic. Um, there is the opposite, which is, okay, what if we keep the tunnel, sorry, what if we remove the tunnel, fix up the fight so that it's acceptable to do because if for argument's sake right now you still kill the boss at a high level in a couple of cycles malevolent energy goes to the floor and it's you know it's irrelevant so there is an argument like there is a quick fix in that like, quick fix in inverted commas which is remove the tunnel and for argument's sake all the barriers brothers the rise of six brothers now have i don't know let's say 100k or 200k health each you have something higher than 50k anyway that was really long-winded but the question, that's kind of the thought process to explain. Like, you have options. Um, I'm more interested to know what players would choose out of the two. I think I already know. And I would, I think if you were to give me your answer, tell me what type of player you are as well. Like, you know, I, I don't kill bosses oh, much. Oh, yeah, so be it. like, end, end game PVMer, newer PVMer. Yeah. yeah. Um, am I allowed to answer? Or, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I can as a player or not. It's your stream. You can answer whatever you like. <laughs> My thinking is the... The tunnel was cool back in the day because of the ratio of tunnel to not tunnel. Was actually solved two minute boss fight, 30 second tunnel, risk your loot. But now it's just kind of annoying and make the only real purpose of the tunnel is to teach new players where to disable the screen shake feature in their settings, um, in my experience. So to me, what I would do is you don't want the ends to tank. I think the one concern, like, I think you could just can the tunnel completely. I don't really see the benefit of making you have to risk your loot repeatedly going through the tunnel because an endgame player is never going to lose their loot anyway. And it's just going to add that extra length of time to a newer player that has to bank every kill. So to me, I would get rid of the tunnel completely because you don't want to do something that makes it just better for endgame players that are killing it in six seconds and makes it more annoying or equally annoying for a new guy. And then the thing that I would do with the boss fight is... And maybe this is a hot take. I would love to see some older bosses get, I don't want to say power creep adjusted completely because I don't, I wouldn't want it linear. Like we're doing four times more damage than before. So give everything four times life points. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far, but I would love to see some, some little adjustments to that. So an example of rise of the six, you don't want rise of the six to die in six seconds. So maybe you give them a hundred K life points each. So it's still for the top teams. It's still a six second boss, or sorry, a point six second boss fight. But when you're just kind of hitting stuff, the boss at least lasts 10 seconds or 15 seconds. It still feels like an old boss, but there's a chance that you experience a mechanic. So to me, I would actually love to see some some older bosses given a little bit of, of love that way. And I think that conversation's been started a lot via, I mean, necromancy, but also even the Bolg and the Fractured Staff Arminal. And players have a lot of power now compared to before. And I think one good thing is it trivializes dated mechanics on old bosses but it also can trivialize good fun well-designed mechanics at the time for some of those bosses as well so i would love to see like a dedicated period of time where you you go through some some old bosses i mean calvary king's a good example you get rid of the green shields you get rid of the red shield 
and you can you can make other adjustments as well just to make it feel a little bit closer to a 2023 boss yeah no i mean it's fair it's completely fair um this is a really good design thought for what it's worth uh, especially to the chat like if you read i also know some people in the chat have lied about their experience because i also know who they are but um <laughs> that's fine obviously it's whoa but um, it, it's an interesting thing because what you'll realize if you read the chat, um, I know this is obviously a small sample size, by the way, and we wouldn't make any changes based on a random group of, you know, a Twitch chat. But it's just an exercise to talk about. No one really has said raise the HP because what you'll find is as players, change isn't, uh, I mean, change isn't appreciated in a lot of cases, right? Change is bad. Like That's kind of the North. Oh, no, change is bad. And also rebalance, but like, you'll get this argument that, oh, we want things to be harder or, you know, we want things to be more fun, et cetera, et cetera. But the moment, like, something becomes longer or, let's say, harder in inverted commas, it's never really the option people want. Um, but they would be okay with it in most cases. Like, from, from like, experience, let's just say we remove the... If we remove the tunnel and made them 100k, just as an example, some people might say, oh, now the fight's different, like, it takes longer, et cetera, et cetera. But after a few days, it'd just be normal. Like that's, that's just rocks now. You know, it's a, it's a regular boss fight. You walk in the room and you fight them. And I think it's one of those things which is like, as designers, we have to, I wouldn't say deal with, but like we have to handle, we understand there is a hurdle to get over, but we know it will be fine on the other side, I guess is a way to put it. Like we know that maybe we make the change and we've got a bunch, you know, like a group of players saying, oh, we don't like this. And then a week later, it's fine. Um, we also can acknowledge that sometimes we don't and we do it wrong. Um, I guess if I was to give my take, it's very difficult for ROTS. Like, this is why I bring it up. Because you have to ask as well, what does the tunnel actually offer? What is it actually doing? For your high-level players, absolutely nothing. You're never dying, right? You're always getting out. So what are we doing? We're just giving you... We're making you spend 20 seconds on our game that you love running through a tunnel. Why not just do the fight? Because you enjoy, I'm sure, people more enjoy fighting than they do running, right? Yeah. Um, that's just a just a. I'm, I'm simplifying, but kind of to get the point. And what is it doing for less experienced players? Maybe making them quit the boss <laughs> because they just they just got their kill and lost their stuff. It's this like weird like it's a weird mechanic in that it doesn't add much for the lower level players. In fact, it makes the experience worse. It also but it's a, a seasickness level, check. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the, also the weird spin on the camera for sure. Um, it, it's one of those mechanics where to look at it. Like, it means nothing to a high-level player to run through. It's just business as usual. You kind of just got accustomed to, oh, yeah, we do 20 rots kills an hour because we spend, you know, 30 seconds every kill running out for argument's sake. But, yeah, it's just an interesting thing because I think that the tunnel offers nothing. I think, In fact, I think it's worse because no one likes... We talked about death costs, right, for so long. No one likes losing stuff. And yeah. this comes from, like, for argument's sake, high-level community lost more because they had more stuff and they were worth more, right? So your death costs were higher. But relatively, your average player, their death cost might be lower, but their wealth is lower. Therefore, it's still a loss for them. Um, but yeah, it's just an interesting thing because I guess I don't know if this is the right thing, but I do think the tunnel doesn't offer anything. It's kind of a negative design nowadays. And I would argue removing the tunnel and figuring out what that means for the fight is better. I would, I would agree with that. And I would assume a majority of players would as well. And to take it back to what you said earlier about you know that the player base has an aversion to change. If ever everyone that spends a lot of time in this community knows this. But I think as as game devs, one of the things that you mentioned that that really speaks to me and I think a lot of people maybe don't think about or maybe they do think about, but you don't have to necessarily like your job isn't to appease the current player base. It's to look at the long term health of the game and to say, okay, this might upset some people right now, but long term, the end result is this is a better boss fight that flows better, that is more enjoyable for these current players that just don't know it yet and for the future players as well. And I think that's something that's really, really difficult to to navigate, especially when you know, I mean, I'm sure you've you've experienced this, a lot of the changes, I'm sure even for the skulls change, the, the change to death skulls and, and fixing the bug there, like I'm sure there was a lot of pushback on that too, because a lot of players felt like you were taking their power away. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, like, like you say, like I, we, we, all, we obviously care about everyone. I can't stress to you, like for, for what it's worth, it's half 11 right now. I'm sitting here talking about what's essentially work, but like I love it. Um, like we are so, I mean, I don't need to 
mention it too much, but there is such a passionate group of people who work on this game and everyone means well. I guess that's always the thing I'd always ask or like say is like you have to remember everyone means well. Like changes aren't made because we don't want you to have fun, like quite the opposite, right? Um, and using Death Skulls as an example, it was a bug. Um, we fixed it. There are some other bugs in Necromancy that need fixing, um, which will inherently bring power down or some mechanics will change. And that's just the nature of what needs to happen. But we'll move on. We'll all continue playing, you know. Oh, look, yeah, oh, rip in the chat. I mean, it's not a surprise. Um, I think someone mentioned things like uh, Death Mark can trigger multiple times. That shouldn't happen. If you're just getting into RuneScape now, I say just, like, let's just say you've been playing for a while and, you know, you're leveling up and you play, take part in double XP weekends or whatever you're doing, you're an Iron Man. Um, at some point, somewhere, someone or a guide is going to tell you to go and do a thing. In a lot of those cases, the thing that you get told to do came out in 2007 or 2009 or 2012 or whenever it came out. Something that you're being told to do is old. Now, putting a player into something that is old has its you know, run of risks like, oh, well, the thing doesn't work properly anymore or it's very unintuitive, etc, etc. Um, it's kind of an example like that's just the nature of a giant MMO, you know, but um, it's those sorts of things that I think can be overlooked by for I'm going to say current players. Now, we don't expect you to think about these things, but it's just I'm just being open, I guess, as a designer. Um, we have to think about that. Um, if someone is just getting into RuneScape, they're leveling up and suddenly somewhere tells them to go and kill Rise of the Six. And they say they're an Iron Man, they tell you to get a shield. When you go to Rise of the Six, like, there is so many, like, things... I'm using Rise of the Six as an example again, sorry, this could be any boss. There could be something at that boss that makes you go, nah, you know, F this, I'm not doing bossing now. And, like, that's yeah. a big thing for us. Like, we don't want you to have those thoughts and feelings. And, like, we have to think about that. Um, as a high-level player who can do all bosses or someone who works on logs or anything like that, if something changed there, you're probably still going to do it. Now, I'm not saying we're not, we're not, like, obviously we're considering of your thoughts, but like, there are many players who will just not do certain things because their first experience is bad. Um, yeah. I use my partner as an example. Like, she just really doesn't like combat, um, like to do combat in RuneScape. She's more skill aside. And like, I remember when she was doing like Telos, like, she really struggled. And I was like, you can get it done. Like, you're good. You, you got it. You got it. But like, because I know how to do it, it seems simple, but it's just not the case, right? Like, she's really stressing about it. Um, she got it done. But, um, you know, I'm not going to see her go back. You know, she's not going to go back. Yeah, no, no, um, no of, of course not. Um, but it, again, I guess another point is it's also okay if you don't want to do certain content in this game. Like, the game is huge. You do not need to do everything. If you don't want to, I don't know, say you're a skiller and you don't like combat, that is fine. But I would like to think that from my point of view, it's like, why don't you like combat? Because if the reason is, oh, I just, I just, you know, I just don't like killing in games, so I don't do it, fine. But if your thing is, oh, because RuneScape combat is bad, then that's something we should solve, um, I guess is a way of putting it. It's fine to play RuneScape and never train other skills unless you want to, because, you know, you need quest unlocks or whatever. And that's also fine. But, like, if you were to pick up a game like Diablo or, I don't know, League of Legends, just use some examples, they are, or Call of Duty, they're very focused on a very specific thing, right? Like, if you don't like shooting, like, you probably shouldn't play Call <laughs> You of Duty, probably like, wouldn't play COD, you know? yep. But, like, RuneScape is a diverse game. There are as many things you can do. So it's okay to not want to do certain things. Um, but obviously, I guess our main aim is to try to find out why you don't want to do it. And if your reason is our fault, we should fix that. Yep. Sorry, again, ramble. But No, that's perfect. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense to me is, yeah, the, the idea that, yeah, not everyone has to play everything. It's a 20-year-old game with a ton of stuff. There are people in my chat probably that like just love playing mini games. And that's all they do. And 10, 15-year-old mini games might be what they do. Maybe they want to play castle wars or and it doesn't mean everyone should should have to feel that way and i think the same could be said with pvming not uh, not everyone has to but if the reason people aren't doing it is because they're scared of it or they had a terrible first experience um to me that's like the perfect thing to to tackle and 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 try to address as as i don't want to say as quickly as as possible but to me that's a much larger issue is if these people maybe want to pvm or would want to but they've had these horrible experiences or it doesn't make sense or the game uh doesn't tutorialize it in a way that that makes sense for their brain so no i'm i'm completely with you on that very cool i had one other open-ended question for you if you could like narrow it down to one singular thing what was your biggest learning that came out of the necromancy skill because it's kind of different from any other skill release or content release that runescape has ever had one takeaway that is difficult um i mean with everything i ever work on i learn a shit ton 
Um, I'm not divert. I'm not sorry. Avoiding your question, but um, <laughs> no, no, you're if, good. If you go through every update I've ever worked on, you'll probably see there's something new in it, in the sense of like, oh, they tried this thing, or you know, I just I can't even think. Deep sea fishing added differences to fishing, and then it tried the merchant thing, or um, archaeology tried whole new things. It tried this whole mystery concept. Zuck added immune hit splats. Rakja tried this new buff. Like this, there's, there's just stuff between, and we learn a lot. Um, necromancy obviously is a whole new skill. There is so much. I don't know if I could nail a specific point. Design is hard. Designing combat is very hard. Designing combat in a game which already has combat is very, very hard. And so I think there are a lot of learnings there. Um, there's a lot of good learnings and a lot of, when I say bad learnings, I mean there's a lot of positives of like, that was really good, that really worked, this is really done well. And there's also a lot of, that could have been better, what can we do about that, where do we want to take it? I guess that's maybe it's a cop out answer, but no, I can't that's that's really that's go into detail. reasonable as a learning. And I have a follow up to that. Is there any? I mean, we talked about getting new players to have this positive PVMing experience because right now you can't make a Zamorak every year because not enough players actually play Zamorak. So we have to work with these players that don't PVM, figure out why they don't, and then try to make changes to help them have this good first experience. And and you spoke to necromancy being very successful at that, which makes me very happy because that's kind of, kind of my bread and butter. But my question would be, is there going to be any kind of effort or, and I know you're doing a, doing a combat beta sort of around this, but is there going to be any kind of effort to look at the things that have been successful with necromancy and then look at potentially, I'll say, necromancifying some of the aspects of the existing three combat styles, some of the things that went really, really well that the players liked and seeing if there are ways to apply them to the other three styles. Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, what that is could be multiple steps. I think like I can say this, I am happy to. Things like damage potential, so removing hit chance, that's a no brainer for us. Like we can just do that. Um, like we could for argument say sorry, when I say could in Game Jam tomorrow, I could go and do all the work for all the styles, and we could probably just release that on its own, like that as a step, because it on its own, it does pretty well. Now, obviously, when I say I could just do it tomorrow, what I don't mean by that is like there's a lot of items to fix, like, right? Like, what does anything that affects hit chance actually do now? What does uh, Engineer of Humans do? Does it stay as it is because it offers 100%? You know, there's loads of that stuff to solve. But that's like one of the simple ones. I think that I don't think anyone in the game would disagree with us that that's a good change. Sorry. I don't think anyone would say that's a bad change. Things like critical strike stuff, I think we think the system is better and we'd like to roll it out. In terms of the numbers and the values, that's up for debate, like what they should and could be. Um, I guess a way of putting it is, you know, Necromancy has 75% crit damage at 120. Does that mean we need 75% in other styles? Should it stay as 75%? Uh, maybe melee gets 100% crit strike damage you know maybe range has 20 percent critical strike chance because it's range is about precision or something like that so yeah. the details not sure when it comes to like things like auto attacks that one is a bit trickier um and i say that because it is easy in inverted commas for me to make a ranged auto attack a melee auto attack and a magic auto attack actually magic's a bit more complex because it kind of already has magic spells and we'll go into that later but but do there is a degree of like sh how do we do that properly? Because necromancy, of course, has a basic attack and two basic abilities. If we add a basic attack to necrom, uh, sorry, to melee, I don't even know how many basics melee has, but I know it's a lot. Like I can't even remember off the top of my head, but it's like six at least, isn't it? I can't. Remember, it's got to be more than that. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't include the like the 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 horror. Yeah, you know, I don't include those ones in my okay. In my yeah. Thing. But but. But yeah, whatever it is, it's a lot, right? So that one's harder because the problem that that solves is minor on its own. If we don't fix what basics are in all styles, we would be better off, for argument's sake, just changing one of the basic abilities to have GCD, as it's called now. That would be the quicker, like piercing shot, for example, could be GCD. Or... I know that they've been buffed since. Um, Sponge did some buffs with Fort Slayer, right? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't know what the pro Fort Slayer is, what it was called internally. Um, but yeah, so like then of course, like you see the comments already about four tick AA. So again, like what does that mean? For, you know, there are caveats to things and it's like, I think there is a, this is why game dev takes time because there are quick approaches, but they would change fundamentals of the game that various players enjoy. Now, I think that four tick AA as a fundamental mechanic 
doesn't make sense. It, it, it's not intentional, really. But I understand what people like about it. Will we ever see an improvement <laughs> how grouping system works? Honestly, yes, because I hate the grouping system with a passion. And I think that if we, here's the thing. I'm not going to go into detail because I'm really going to avoid it this time now. But grouping system sucks. Like, I'll say it like it does. It, it does really suck. Um, if RuneScape has a good grouping system, I think the possibilities change massively. Like, if you can log in, queue up, you can see, like, I don't know, like a group finder. You can see what's available. You can click it. They, they, they have a message and they're open to learners. Like, I think the game changes if we have a good grouping system. So I think the answer is yes. But how do we get there is very difficult because... In all honesty, the grouping system kind of needs ripping out and re-implementing to do a proper system, and that is a big project, but I think we have to do it at some point. So it's not a case of, oh, well, we'll never do it. Um, yeah, TLDR, yes. Why does Ratchet heal on P4? Why not just give the boss 200k more HP? Was there a reason, or just because you were like, hmm, effort? Ratchet heals, it's more a narrative thing, because you're like, he's like, open the gates, and sorry, I'll open the gates, can't remember what he says now. I'll open the gates, bring him through or something. And the idea is that you're bringing him through to, like, capture him, and he gets pissed off, so he regens some health. That's kind of the narrative. Um, could he have just had 200k more HP? Yes. I think we look at this now with, like, things like Telos, and especially since we've changed the XP, uh, how XP is calculated. Sorry, we, it was always like this, but now that we've made bosses viable XP, bosses like Telos, Virago, etc. kind of suck because they have a lot of HP, but it's incremental right 250 k's um maybe would be better off just giving them the full one point something million and you know um someone said arc glacor or drop rates 100 percent changed i do agree with that i actually think that arc glacor is too punishing for drop rates i think it's i guess this is something i bring up a lot runescape has lots of content to do it's a very time time demanding game there's yep. a lot of things to do and we ask a lot of time from you i think that MMOs in 2023, again, this is a short answer, but we need to demand less time of you um, and just, just let you enjoy it and have fun. And RNG is great when you're lucky, but it's really, really bad when you're not, right? Like if you get a good log and you complete a log at a couple hundred kills, you feel great. If you haven't completed a log after a couple of thousands, my God, it sucks. It sucks. And I think yeah. that that's something we could be improving because some of the bosses, like I, I have the same example. Um, I have 2,000 hard mode Glacor kills. I don't have a single core yet. I've spent however many hours that is, right, doing the boss. You could equate that to multiple single player games that, you know, AAA single player releases in terms of hours. And it's like, I think that that is something we should be addressing. Um, sorry, I am rushing these questions. No, no, that's I want to make sure I answer everyone. No, that's great. And I, for what it's worth, I think that would be such a, a well liked thing. I think my opinion on bad luck mitigation, I used to be like, well, bad luck mitigation doesn't really matter because really the issue is drop rates in general are too rare. So if you're three times over, you're actually 30 hours dry and if just fix the drop rates themselves and then you don't need it. But I think I've kind of, I don't like Zami's bad luck mitigation at all. I think the way that it's designed so you can like game the system by doing 10, 100% kills and then you do your highest rage. Like I don't like any of that, but I would love to see something implemented where one, you make some drop rates better. And then two, you also make it less likely kind of like how clues have this like baby bad luck mitigation for dies it's like the smallest slightest thing ever i think you go a little more heavy-handed than that but just so that if you're two times three times over your drop rate does does get a little bit of extra uh a little bit of extra help just so that you don't have that terrible experience yeah no i agree this is completely off topic well it's related but random we once had this conversation about streaking and how streaking is good and bad etc um and we said why does streaking matter in the sense of this concept that you can die? Why not just reward players for milestones? So you know how Reaper points, Slayer points, etc. You get bonus points at milestones. Um, you know, every clue scrolls. You know, there was a question of like, why not every, for argument's sake, 50 kills at a boss, just give double drop for that 50th kill? And it's just a random thing. But it's nothing to do with streaking, but it's this idea that like you're incentivized to hit milestones. Um, random thought. There's more to that Ooh. context of I, I mean, it, it. that's a nice way to help with drop rates. <laughs> because, yeah, it doesn't actually yeah. solve anything, but it just, they're just feel good moments. Oh, yeah, I'm coming up to my double drop. I'm going to do seven more kills. Um, it's kind of a way to lighten the load, but it doesn't solve any problems. It's just a random thought. Yeah, I'm cool with um, that random thought. I like it. There's a mention of like power creep, right? 
um, with net currency, like the severe level of power creep that it has in comparison. And I know a lot of people comparing it to like fractured staff of Armadou in the sense of, you know, you nerfed fractured staff. Why is net currency like this? Um, it's kind of piece one in a bigger, not puzzle, sorry, it's like part one in a bigger journey. Um, now, I wouldn't call it like, you see some people on Reddit say, oh, like Necromancy is EOC2. Like, we're, we're not calling it EOC2 by any means. But it's about like advancing combat in a direction that is more appealing to many players. Um, and how do we get there? And now it's not like just about power, but yes, Necromancy is stronger, but for sure, right? Um, inherently it is stronger even at 99 it's way stronger at 120 because you just don't need you just have 100% hit chance pretty much everywhere um, obviously there are a few places you don't um, someone mentioned like skipping through everything gets boring very quickly you will find that if you are already very good at this game necromancy feels ridiculous for you because it, it, it simplified the process of being good yeah um, so you will skip every like you will skip phases and stuff like are we okay with that long term for the existing bosses, um, let me try to think of a simple way of do, explaining this. If someone wasn't proficient, give them a few weeks in necromancy and they could, they'd probably be doing a whole bunch of stuff they weren't before. That's step one. Um, give them a few more weeks and they'll probably be destroying those that content the same way you are. And I think that's important because once people, more people feel like they're destroying content in it, sorry, I say destroy, I mean like damage and like, yeah, yeah. like feeling power, the better because they, they want the next challenge then. More people want the next challenge at that stage. As I think mentioned, um, a lot of our bosses aren't necessarily designed for this much damage right now. <laughs> now yes, we could rebalance them, but um, oh, this is a big topic. I really should have answered this question earlier, but there is a point here of like a lot of our existing bosses ask you to you people call them dps dummies right or, or spreadsheets um spreadsheeting is a weird term i think because everything can be boiled down to a t regardless at any point um any game really has it unless you're like up against like a dynamic foe that and in most cases that's a player like pvp is very different right like take a league of legends um just yeah. as an example um but at the moment a lot of what people master is not the boss you mean they're mastering outputting damage to kill it quickly and skip all the mechanics but they're not actually it's not really a fight against the boss it's a fight against the combat system yes and what i think we want to move more towards is i'll use virago as an example or yakamaru like raids just a couple of examples where there are more mechanic checks right like beastmaster as an example how how tank works uh, sorry you know, how like, you want to swap tank, you know, I mean, I know there are different strats, but the, the way the mechanics were designed. If, if you have a simpler ability set, something that you can master and learn, like I know that I use living death and I know what this means and I want to use death skulls and I want to use these things. You, your knowledge is forever useful. And then when we design a new boss, we might make the boss, um, for argument's sake, have an ability that if you hit it, with the same ability multiple times, it's detrimental. At this stage, your knowledge of death skulls becomes, I don't want to use that. I'm just using an example. But your knowledge adapts to the boss, not the scenario where a new boss comes out and you have to relearn your ability set. And I say relearn, I mean, that's what a lot of existing styles are, like Hydrix Bolts prop. Oh, what ability do I press now? Is, is There's a lot of like, it's really hard to explain, but there's a lot of decisions to be made in my ability set all the time that is definitely a play style like there are other games i'm sure i don't know how many people here played world of warcraft but like a, a mage in world of warcraft is very like you can be a like a frost mage it's very proc based it's very rng based like this thing procs I, i'd use this I, that is a style but a lot of existing styles have like random damage ranges that are huge right like 20 to 100 percent um, depending on what happens, the variables in the fight are more dependent on random knowledge than good decision making. I don't know if that's a fair way of explaining it. But yeah, like, I would no, rather, I'm with you. Yeah, so a, a boss comes out and I know how my style works, but I have to use my abilities in different ways or not use certain abilities because it's bad to. Kind of the example of don't use a bleed against necks, right? Um, blood phase, right? Blood don't phase, don't yeah. bleed necks. Um, that's good because I know what my bleed is. But if the thing is like, oh, I use my ability and there's a percent chance that something happens or doesn't happen, it, it's a difficult space to be in, especially You're with... Describing Green Shield, by the way. 
Yeah, there you go. Um, but yeah, uh, I really butchered that. It's midnight. I apologize. But, no, no, no. Um, I'm I'm totally with you. Is there's a huge difference between you know knowing hey don't use a bleed on blood phase and the rotation that you're currently doing could just randomly backfire and you have to approach the entire fight tentative. Yeah, there's definitely value in that for what it's worth. Like. Like, I, I, I am fully with this, by the way. Like, I'm a big fan of games where, well, I mean, any games with raids and stuff, I'm a big fan of doing that content, and we do want that. The difference is that RuneScape as a game, nowadays, that content doesn't appeal to most players right now, and we'd li would like to get to a place where it does, right? For sure. You're, yeah. I mean, you're describing my bread and butter. Like, that's the thing that I like the most. I... Don't, I've done some speed killing and, and, and some of it I've dabbled into it just because I wanted to understand it, but I don't enjoy fighting against the combat system and I much prefer fighting against a boss that has really fun engaging difficult mechanics and that's something that I've been kind of, I'd say, missing a little bit in the last few years. So that's sort of the, the main thing that I think has me so excited for Necromancy is I'm hoping that with more people having more power, it gives you guys the ability to make some stuff that's 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 really you know it's mechanical and difficult and challenging and fun and it's not difficult because of all of the switches that i need to do perfectly but it's difficult because of the actual mechanics of the boss fight and and the movement and you know actually playing through the game itself as opposed to playing through enough action bar slots to fly a plane yeah <laughs> i mean you you kind of bring up like um I really enjoy watching videos from some of our best players who do solo duos, you know, that sort of level of content against like Yakamaru and stuff like that, because what you get to experience is they're adapting to the fight and that's what we'd rather, sorry, when they're adapting to the fight, yes, they still know their ability set, like they are experts, so they know everything when it comes to it, but I mean, there is a mechanic that is designed to be solved in a certain way for argument's sake and they find ways to solve it and, and that is what we would rather do um where everyone in the game feels they understand how their style works and they want to adapt to the boss long term that makes the most sense because at that stage we can start like i i, I really believe we can start making bosses that are fucking hard like from a from a challenging perspective of um sorry i'm super passionate about this so now i'm going to talk about it but if we, if we go into a group encounter what i love about group encounters is if any of you here have played any game where you group up that isn't RuneScape and you're doing a, let's say, a raid, um, a World of Warcraft raid, a Destiny raid, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. There might be five of you and you all each individually have a job to do and your job is fairly simple. Like my job is stand on the east side, shoot the ads that spawn, when the sniper appears, make sure I kill him, make sure I detonate the bomb that appears in front of me. But then there are five other players who also have their own things to do and you are relying on five other players. And I, what I love about group fights is even if your th job is simple, you are relying on everyone else to do their job. And then you throw in the odd little crossover mechanics in there where like everyone now needs to do something at the same time. So they have to disrupt their solo experience of like, oh, I'm handling my mechanic to do something together. And that's where like group content becomes crazily fun, but also challenging. It's kind of like back in the day, what you would have seen at Virago, like when it was more punishing or Solak when it was released, right? Like everyone had a job to do and you had to make sure you're doing it. We'd love to do that, I guess, is a way of putting it. I'm, I would I'm really love that. Bashing, but... No, that's perfect. And I, I would love that so much. I think, I mean, you're almost kind of describing the last like Yakamaru Mirage phase, right? Where you've got your two people, like their job isn't hard. They just have to grab planks and go to the right pool and then, you know, use the planks on the pool. But everybody has a delegated job that they have to do. And there's a lot of interaction between those jobs as well. Like I... I quite frankly, I miss that kind of mechanical complexity, and I and I really hope that in the future we can see some of that. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, someone mentioned in the chat. I think you also responded agreeing to it. Um, interestingly, there are a lot of good mechanics at a lot of bosses, but you don't see them because you either kill it too fast or it doesn't it on its own as a mechanic with a multiple people doesn't mean much. Um, but yeah, like Omen mentioned in the chat, like raids has a lot of solid content. The thing is, making a raid now, like nowadays, while we have a grouping system that kind of sucks, while <laughs> you know, like it, it would be so hard to make something that asks you to bring ten people to a bit of content. Sure, there are plenty of like proficient PVMers who could easily get teams of ten, but like it's a, it's a very different world. But but 
like that's where we want to go again like i'd love we'd love to be in a place where we can make five man boss encounters or sorry five player boss encounters 10 player boss encounters i say 10 you guys can do them as twos threes fours fives whatever you like but really like design group mechanics that rely on each other to do their job um and sometimes those like that that create improvisation like oh shit like ryan didn't do his thing what can we do like that that sort of value um whereas none of you are learning your style you know your style you know how to use it and i know that i i I am paraphrasing a lot like i have so much love for this game and i think there is a lot of um there is a lot of room for certain things like i i agree with some of the things that people love about um like what ranged like how ranged works and like how hydrix bolts work and what like crit based adrenaline boosting abilities do i love what people the mechanics and the reasons for them it's about making it more intuitive and whatever have you um i guess another point is like necromancy as an argument of like it's too simple arguably for a high level player who is used to all this complexity it is um but i wouldn't overstate how difficult it still is for many players to press 30 abilities in a row in the same order and not mess it up Um, no i mean we're talking earlier about the average player and you know having unlocks or just being used to pressing abilities isn't something that a lot of players have so to me like necromancy has to be like if if necromancy didn't feel way too simple for me i think it would have failed in terms of its actual objective yeah yeah exactly i have a really quick follow-up to that which is on one hand you'd like to move into a future where there are complex group mechanics and group interaction but also recently most bosses scale in a way where you can bring any amount of people and kill it and the hp scales and i'll use the term like they're very accessible for any any team size solo group four people six people like kind of like what was done with Hermod, where anyone can go and everyone gets a drop and you spoke about maybe making Virago a little more like that in the future too, with a with a different mode. So my question is, is the way to accomplish both of those things just having some bosses that are like that and some bosses that aren't? Because I, I don't see how a boss could have both really, really complex group mechanics and also be really accessible to any amount of players. Um, it's a tough one because like you say, like they're two conflicting points. I think that there is some, it is okay if some content is not available to everyone, but the audience needs to be bigger than what it is. I guess is a way of putting it. Like it's not okay if 99% of the player base can't do something or don't want to do something in a lot of cases. It's fine if only 1% can do for argument's sake 4K Glacor, right? Like that's, that's fine. But if only 1% could do Glacor, that's a problem. I think that there is a scaling number there. Like it could be, you know, 30% of players do this content and 70% don't. That's way better than one one to 99, right? Um, yeah. I think that in your scaling example, there is room for both and there's room for neither. <laughs> and by that, I mean, if you use Virago as an example, let's just say it's 250k HP because it's five. It's designed as a five player encounter. If we allow you to go into seven people, we scale up to 350k, 50k a person. But if you go below five player, we don't change it. So if you want to solo a 250k fight where the mechanics, like you open the challenge to yourself, like more so, like the challenge is already there as a five player, for example, you open it to one player, you can enable yourself to get five drops because it's a five scaled boss, essentially. It's just the low, the min point is it scaled to five. So that's an opportunity. So yeah, let's just say we made a new boss that was a, another five player boss. We would allow you to trio it or solo it, but the health value wouldn't change when you go down but we could potentially scale it up if you go over it kind of, it's kind of like Carapac. imagine if we enabled Carapac to have four players we'd probably add hp whereas you can duo it and solo it right and the hp is the same okay um that, that, that's just an option there is also opportunities that some bosses do not scale because that's just the nature of how they're designed like like you say to make group content available as solo you like I've only designed solo bosses as projects I've worked on, but I've designed group boss mechanics for other people. As in, like, for example, I've only worked on yeah, solo encounters, but I've I talked about Zamrak mechanics, right? When I'd like to like when I get my hands on a group boss, I'd really like to push the need for another player to the point where maybe you cross the line and you actually say you you this is where we walk into the territory of you physically cannot solo this boss. Now, there are always arguments of, oh, but I want to solo it. And that's where maybe there are certain bosses we allow, like we, we draw that line. Because, 
for argument's sake, let's just say there's two buttons in a room and you have to press them at the same time. It's a cool mechanic for argument's sake because we want you to time it. Yeah. But if it physically is impossible for solo, so we either make it in solo that you don't have to do it, which is the Virago thing, you know, like jump on the back, like you don't yeah. have to line it up. I don't know where I'm going with that. But yeah, it's a difficult one. And that's just part of something we have to figure out, I guess. Yeah, I I would imagine it's it's a, like you said, a, it's complicated to do. But to me, if you ever want to make like really complex, like there's a reason why there's only believe one boss in the game that is not soloable. And it's it's Yakamaru. Although it's only not so little due to a recent change in making the insta kills hard type, but basically it has mechanics that require multiple players. And there's no other boss in the game that actually has a mechanic that requires multiple players. And I think so long as everything can be done in a solo, you are gonna lose some some endgame kind of complexity. So I think the right answer might be then maybe this is controversial, but possibly there are some bosses that are not super accessible to solo players because the mechanics and the difficulty of them is that you need actual timing with other players and different players doing different roles so yeah. that's kind of how i feel yeah. about it is i think at a certain point and maybe that comes with matchmaking changes and everything else but i think if everything is is designed to be done in any team size whatever you want it makes it a lot more difficult to to make really like engaging mechanics that are that are really cool and use groups kind of like the other games that you described like ff and uh like wow and any other any other uh any other mmo with some crazy group content yeah no for sure um there's some points in the chat about like making like like you just mentioned it but making every boss scalable has its downsides um we wouldn't want to make every boss scalable like if i was to go and look at existing bosses and consider making some scalable i think there are ones you could just do because why not like, for example, we could make Vindictus scale up to five, because why not? I, I don't think it's hurting anyone if five people want to go and grind the Vindicta log together. That's perfectly fair. Like, what is, what's the problem with that? Um, yeah, like, there's just... I'm oh, sorry, someone said QBD and then your stream elements. But um, QBD, yeah, um, just like, it's one thing we wouldn't do, right? Like, it's designed to be a solo boss. But, I don't know, there, there are just reasons why, like, we could do it. It could be even a case that certain bosses don't become scalable until years later. Like, I'm not suggesting we move into a cycle like that, but there is arguably nothing wrong with certain bosses being scalable. Like, we wouldn't suddenly enable Telos to be duoed, although I'm sure there are plenty of Telos players out there would say that could be pretty cool, but I think that they'd, you'd very quickly realise, unless you change the mechanics, it probably means nothing. Yeah, I mean, all in all, like, there is so much in... Like, there is never a right answer. I think that's a good thing to put out there. Like, we aren't saying, you know, I say we, I'm even talking for myself. Like, I'm not saying that every boss needs to be scalable. I'm not saying every boss needs to be easy. I'm also say, not saying every boss needs to be hard. I think there's a place for everything. You as players obviously don't need to know it, but we, we have to justify things as a business, right? Um, like, as much as I would love to just make whatever all the time, I think that, you know, we have to find the right things to make at the right time. Um, but, you know, just such as the nature. Intercept is an interesting, uh, well, spell. I think intercept is kind of broken, I won't lie. Like, the fact that you can intercept multiple people and just Cade is kind of crazy. You know, maybe you should have only been able to intercept one player, just for argument's sake. But, like, I think that some good mechanics in boss encounters are things that um, directly target a specific thing. And by that I mean, for example, you know how Karapak turns Devotion off? Or Virago, when you're bomb tanking, your defensives go on cooldown. You know, things that are very specific. I think that in a good group encounter, it's okay to ask you sometimes for a very specific mechanic. Like, this person cannot move and is going to take loads of damage. You must stop. You must save them. And for argument's sake, in our game right now, maybe the only way to do that is intercept. And that's okay because it's it's a it's a it's a it's an unlock requirement. We are saying to do this boss, you need intercept, or this player is dead. Now that is okay. There are caveats, which is oh well, I can't do the boss because we don't have intercept. But I think there are good mechanics where that is useful. There is also the case where sometimes it's nicer to offer you uh, an issue that can be solved in multiple ways. For example, the player is going to take fifty thousand damage. How can you stop it? Right? Oh well, I can't vet pot. I will die. Um, I can't 
this I can't res it because we don't allow you to that but I can disrupt it. So disruption shield is one. I could cade it, but cade's adrenaline. Okay, we'll cade an intercepting group fight, like whatever the argument is. Sometimes those mechanics are good because they ask you to do certain things. Um but yeah, things about putting stuff on cooldown is very interesting as well. Like if you're in a group encounter and as a group, let's just say this is a throw mechanic out there, let's just say the boss is doing this big bomb and all of you have to defend. However, Whichever defensive mechanic each of you uses, the boss disables it for everyone. So if you disrupt and I res and someone else barricades, all three of those are now disabled for the rest of the fight. So the next time he bombs, we're all like, shit, what, the, what do we do? You just <laughs> wasted it. So like, it's more built as, okay, everyone, first run, let's all disrupt. Second run, let's all res. Like, those are sort of mechanics that, like, simply put, all we're saying is, oh, just make sure you res the first one, disrupt the second one. But as a team, you always get the person that accidentally forgets or doesn't use something and the punishes the team. And those are cooler team mechanics because you're inherently you're in control of yourself, but you're communicating. Yeah, sorry, that's just an off the, te- off the top of the head <laughs> That example, sounds so but, cool. Yeah. Because I think that we're not tied to cooldowns. Like, yes, you use an ability and it goes on a 30-second cooldown, but there's nothing to say a boss can't literally put your ability on five-minute cooldown if it wants to. Why not? Like, we can. Um, And yes, exactly what Omid said, which is kind of the old Virago team split. It was always fun to kill a teammate when their team split. It was just always the thing to do on Virago. You had that certain friend that you're like, nah, I'm going to kill you. Um, And I think you get the same example in, like, these fights where someone's like, yeah, tell you what, I'm just going to use... I've resed and disrupted. Good luck, everyone. You know, that sort of thing. Um, just because it's fun. Because um, also, that's another thing. Like, playing RuneScape should be fun. I know that sounds obvious, but people should be having fun. And sometimes fun means just laughing and not actually getting kills. Like, it is entertaining to just mess around. Um, not everything is about, like, best kills per hour and all that sort of stuff. One of my favorite experiences in this game was learning Virago. And I was terrible at the reflex, and I never understood when they would come out. So for like at least a year and a half, everyone in my clan that would take me would call me Reflect Ryan, and they would like make a point of barricading all the reflex just whenever I was on the team, and like it was really fun. Um, but I and I also don't think it's obvious. I think a lot of people kind of lose sight of why they, you know, why what, what the not that everyone has the same purpose of the game, but the, lose sight of the idea that yeah, RuneScape doesn't just have to be a grind or a constant in your life. It can be something that you actually you know gives you really pleasant experiences that you love, that you enjoy, that you that you have fun doing. So you know, it's really good to see like the fact that that's very prevalent in your mind. I think is is really important because at the end of the day, that is what RuneScape is all about. That's what it should be all about. It should be about giving players an opportunity to have fun and enjoy themselves. I apologize, but I will need to go. It's now half 12. <laughs> no, um, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, thank you for having me on, and thanks for everyone to listening to me ramble. Um, the only final like summary point I'd give is more than happy to chat about design and RuneScape at any point. We always mean well. I mean, like a lot of things I say are just me speaking. Like I'm happy to speak my mind. Um, a lot of thought goes into things. Like We're not just changing stuff for no reason. Um, and like I, I, we also get things wrong. Like, that's another thing. Um, I've made many mistakes in my time. Some visible, some not so visible. Um, but yeah, more Wait, than happy to just chat again. You mean to tell me that game developers are human beings? Yeah. I don't Sometimes believe it. We don't, you might not think it. But. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. This was an absolute blast. And honestly, like, any time, if you want to come on and, and just do exactly this kind of informal kind of ramble, talk about design... Uh, I'm always, always around. Thank you so much for uh, for for sharing so much of your insight and for spending so much time with us at after midnight. Uh, it's really, really appreciated. So yeah, just wanted to say really quickly, it uh, it means a lot to me, and uh, I think it means a lot to a lot of other people in the community as well that you're down to just you know come on by and uh, and and share your thoughts on on game design, something that a lot of us don't get a lot of insight into.